Hey, um, unfortunately, I tried YouTube's uploader and uh, direct upload didn't work. So I popped back over to Ustream. Here we go to the palette cam. Missed the, the beginning of this painting, but we'll jump back into it. Act like we're at the beginning right now. Gonna take some phthalo blue, some cadmium red. This is how we make black every time. And, you know, is it black? No, it's not black. But as one of my teachers, Betsy Ruprecht, Elizabeth Ruprecht, uh, would say, you don't want to punch a hole into your painting. So there's no need to, uh, no need to go too dark. So, unfortunately, I lost the beginning of this video, but basically, I... I popped in the darks, as you can see, from this color. So we've only been using one color so far, I've been painting about 10 minutes. Um, and we're just blocking in the big darks, working on an abominable snowman. Uh, the abominable snowman being another cryptid, of course. And this is a tutorial called How to Add uh, an Abominable Snowman to a winter scene. Perhaps he is currently in, uh, in the Himalayan mountains near Tibet. One good thing about painting abominable snowmans is that they're just essentially one giant texture, really. You know, they have this little tiny area in their face up here. But essentially, they're just a big giant texture of furballness. And um, the main thing you gotta do is just play with this texture. I think one of my problems I'm foreseeing with this painting is that I don't have a really good small brush. So, I'm going to have to adapt. Nope. All right, so I'm going to go up the ladder now, go back to the palette cam, and we're just going to take this up just with yellow. It's going to turn green, and then we're going to take some red and take our green to brown. Kind of hard to see on the, the video, but we now have one value higher just by adding more yellow and red to our black color here. I'm going to go pop back to our Yeti and uh, we're just going to carve out some more some more values. Working mainly on big value shapes here. That's a nice little really subtle variation. I'm sure you can't see on camera but this stage is always very important. A lot of painting is about hiding these, these subtle nuances. Like they look like they're the same dark, but there's still a vibration happening between them. As you can see, we're painting, we're attacking this painting very broadly. I'm using no medium with, at all. This is just straight oil paint and a smidgen. A smidgen of uh, linseed oil, but barely any, mostly just the linseed oil in the paint. And uh, one good thing about painting like this is that uh, you don't use any paint thinner. And so there's less requirement for ventilation and these sort of things. So uh, linseed oil isn't toxic, to my knowledge, in terms of the smell of it. And I believe it's, it's pretty much just like, you know, if you had a, a cup of vegetable oil on your, on your counter, just be careful about the type of, you know, linseed oil that you get. And at this point, I'm not even really looking at any source material. I use some to do this kind of burnt sienna sketch in the beginning. But now I'm just kind of playing with this texture 
figuring out my light source. You know, he's he's got a, a tough light source because obviously this is late in the day, and uh, I mean very late in the day. I imagine that this scene is taking place after the sun has set. You know, the sun probably set half hour ago or so, and. Because of that, you know, because we were going to sit down and make a fire and cuddle up for the night, and we looked up and we saw the, the abominable snowman walking up to us, being like, why are you in my hood? Um, he's backlit, you know. We haven't got the fire going yet, and... You know, we're just getting our stakes out of the ground, having thoughts of insecurity. Why did I come here? Why did I want to climb the Himalayan mountains? And most importantly, why did I forget to bring my bear mace? I'm surprised nobody's maced. Like, nobody's ever said they've maced in a, an abominable snowman or a, or a yeti or scat sasquatch, whatever you want to call it. It's always that, you know, it threw something and then they ran off. But a lot of people carry mace, and in the U.S. at least, a lot of people also carry guns. Not, you know, the majority of the population or anything, but... I had a gun growing up. I got my first gun when I was five years old. 22, uh, single shot. Got it from my grandpa. And we'd go shoot animal skulls in the gravel pit. Because uh, my grandpa got a bunch of gravel. And they're like, hey, what you gonna do with that gravel? And uh, so he took it. He could use it on roads and stuff like that out on his farm. Speaking of which, the name of where we're broadcasting from right now, Bliss Farm Gallery, named after my grandpa. But anyway, yeah, I got, I got my first gun when I was five, and I carried around a gun walking around, you know, hunting and hunting rabbits and pheasant and all this sort of stuff. So why, uh, seems like the Sasquatch always seems to... be aggressive towards people without weapons. So maybe that could be a new standpoint or a platform of the NRA. Go back to the pallet cam. We're gonna go back, going up the ladder, as I like to say. Just gonna take more yellow. It's gonna go green from the blue. And then we reduce the greenness with red to go back to brown. I just cleaned my palette as you saw in the other video. It's really kind of obnoxious because I have a bunch of little pieces of stuff in there now. Alright, next palette up. Just trying to define these muscle shapes. Standing at seven foot two feet tall, uh, abominable snowmen are very muscular cryptids. Whenever you're in doubt, you can always add a Bigfoot. Any scene, any moment in life, like if you're, you're getting depressed and you're not sure what to do with your life, you can just start wearing a, you know, a Bigfoot costume and go to work. Maybe you lose your job, but you're still in a Bigfoot costume. And these are 
These are decisions we make. So when in doubt, add, add a yeti. And I remember these great words. Uh, obviously at the onset of, what should I put in this painting? Oh, there's mountains. That means there's an abominable snowman there. This guy's a little bit taller and kind of lanky, lanky snowman creature. Hands are going to give me a run for my money later on. Especially since the surface of this painting is super smooth. I think we're almost ready for another palette cam. Hold your brush in different ways, you know? One of the biggest parts of a painter is merely learning to work without resting your hand. You know, they are these things that you can get to lay across your painting to really study your hand, and they're nice. They're good. They work well, but I don't use them. Not because I'm cool, but I find them kind of cumbersome. Now this is a, you know, this is a dark Yeti, obviously. Um, his natural color would be kind of like a badger-like color almost. I'm not going for like a polar bear Yeti. Although I could, I still could at this point, but he'd have to be dark all around. Um, still going to go up, still going to add more, more yellow. I'm going up all these browns here. You can see how you build a nice value scale. These are really subtle differences. I'm not going to use much of this, but snap in there. There you go. Uh, just pop it in a few places. Just kind of rounding out these major shapes. Yo, it's gonna be okay. Let's keep telling yourself that. These are just some some random little shapes. You always want to work the inside of your shapes. And you got fur, fur of any type. Already back to the to the palette cam. This is gonna be a big departure. We're gonna go with a little bit of white, and you're gonna watch how this suddenly changes everything. My white is not wet at all. We haven't cleaned our brush once yet though. Get rid of that. But there's a good a good word for like a piece of lint, like some Schmuckus or something in Yiddish, I don't know. Should be. Adding a little bit of white here. You know, individual sas Sasquatch colors can vary, of course. But this is a nice way to make a, a value scale. I'm really playing the, 
the corners now, or edges. Whisking my brush a little bit to, to get some effect of fur. I think as I go higher, basically, uh, I'm going to go a little bit bluer as well. Now this is, I'm straightening this out because I'm focusing too much on that, that form without the, without the fur. As Jasper Johns always said, Never paint form over fur. So we should always stress the furriness of our yetis that we draw and paint. The underlying form should always be present. And this is a recurring problem with painting. Whether you're drawing clothes on somebody, you want to get the texture of the clothes but you also want to retain the form underneath it. Just got the new film, uh, well not new, it was made in 1975, called A Boy and His Dog, which was, I believe it was Don Johnson. Yeah, it was Don Johnson, of course. Mark Hamill stuck into my head because he kind of looks the same age, the same time as Don Johnson in 75, but um, it's an interesting one to check out, post-apocalyptic earth with a boy and uh, his dog, and his dog can smell women. So they go out trying to find women. Eventually finds a kind of 1984 underground community of people that are living in strange alternate reality of the blown out apocalyptic wasteland which lie above the bunker which they inhabit. Hope we're ready for another step up the pallet cam ladder. Take more white. You can see my paint, I paint really thick, and you want to make sure that you can cover, you know? And I'm going to go with just a smidgen of blue at this point. It's going to give him that glow of the, the environment he's in a little bit more. As long as we make sure that we're still going up the the value scale. Yeah, and this is really gonna pop out as a different variation wherever we put it. Because we're playing with temperature now too. When painting you should always consider the temperature of your colors, not only the value. Those are the two fundamentals you're working with. And we determine temperature pretty much in a very simple manner, which is cold stuff is blue.
orange stuff goes orange, more or less. There can be, there can be warm olive, olive greens. And there can be very, very cold sea greens. But we like to, we like to make these colors get some little vibrations amongst themselves. And when we put warm colors next to cool colors, they, they kind of start to vibrate a little bit in our eyes. Tend to like these vibrations. Yeah, and we're almost ready for the for the final color. Got about two left, I'd say. Then we have to get a little bit more picky with where we're where we're putting our colors towards the end here. What deserves to be a highlight? What doesn't deserve to be a highlight? The hands were going to go a little bit different color. Yeah, we're going to go for a final color. I'm going to go with two different, I'm going to go up the ladder and then I'm going to make a warm and cool on my highlight. You can go a little bit purple with this one. And then we'll tune it down. We're still higher though, right? Yeah. Always checking to make sure we're still going up the ladder, value-wise. This is almost a purple. And we're going to use this very sparingly. It's always easy to just keep going and keep going and keep going, but sometimes it's more important to just hold back. Yeah, that's all I'm going to use that for. I'm going to look for a variation of this. We're going to go. We go more towards a blue, but we need to go lighter. Just watching ourselves go up, but keep that. Colors are still almost identical in terms of value. Very close. But this is still lighter than this blue. Yeah. 
Just trying to get the furballness of this. Make it furry. Make it furry. I'm going to get a little bit. Maybe I won't actually. Wondering about this warms and these white shapes. I think there needs to be some warms, so we're going to put those in too. Still using just one brush. I haven't even cleaned this one brush this whole time yet. He is going to be backlit a little bit, so these are going to become more and more important. Come back and finish those up later. Yeah. I think I'm going to go with some warms. I'm just going to fill up these shapes first and I'm going to kind of go for my final round of warms. This fur, this fur bob. So back to the palette cam, the value scale builder. I'm just slowly going to colonize this pile with my orange pile to get my new brown variation, which should be about the same. We're going to want to go a little bit lighter. So I'm going to take yet another color, another pile of white. Barely a dab of linseed oil. If we want more orange, we can just steal it from there. Nice. Back to the abominable snowman. He's entering his final stages. Now I'm just going to go for it. This is still the blocking in phase of the snowman. I think we shall call him Pete. Pete the Snowman. Not Peter. Just Pete. Have you guys seen Pete? Nope. Now we get a nice little variation with our, with our blues and our oranges right smack up against each other. I 
the surface of this painting is, is kind of difficult, actually, because it's so... The painting was so old, and it was literally, like, sanded flat. Like, I mean, this surface is really smooth. So every single mark, you know, it's just your brush and the surface. I guess that's what it always is, but there's no texture to kind of to hide mis mistakes or edges are very tight. If you know, of course, Yetis have belly buttons. I would imagine. I wonder what a bear's belly button looks like. I've never really thought. You know, I've never looked at a bear's belly button. I keep thinking of bears, you know, like I keep thinking that Abominable Snowmen must be closer related to like a polar bear. You know, like in all actuality, I suppose, I wonder what the difference between a polar bear and a monkey is, like a great ape. I think we're, yeah, we are closest, like 99% of our DNA is like the great apes, but I wonder how similar like ape DNA is with, with bear DNA. Because they are big, like big furry things with basically this abominable snowman is kind of a mixture of a, an ape and a bear and a human. People often ignore the ignore the bear element. I think. Now, one thing I've you know I've noticed with a lot of these paintings where I'm doing the background first and then I'm laying my characters on top of them is they tend to have a very harsh edge, especially when I'm doing this white. You know, basically, I just put a blob. I don't know if I can't remember what I said in the first video that got erased, but I just put a blob of white here in the basic shape of that I wanted my my snowman to be, and then I you know did a quick quick value drawing in in acrylics where I imagine some shapes being and musculature this sort of stuff. And then I just jumped into, jumped into painting. Be a weird reflection there, but we'll go with it. I imagine uh, a yeti would nurse, probably, wouldn't they? You know, I have I have one yeti painting, Sasquatch painting I did. I guess I'm kind of differentiating here, but what they're called is based upon the geographical location, not that I'm the world's leading expert on yetis, but I do know the Abominable Snowman, or I think he was referred to as Mehte, M-E-H-T-E-H, by the people in Tibet. I saw some documentary where they had like this cap this like yeti cap that the monks still have. And he's kind of an interesting creature, and you know I don't really care if he's if he's real or not. It's kind of beside the point for me. I think as a legendary creature, he's he's interesting, and as a real creature, he would also be interesting. But perhaps. Some of the magic of these creatures is the fact that they are mystical and they don't exist. And we should be able to be okay with that, right? Not everything has to be literal. I'm just kind of trying to soften up my edges here. And I know he's backlit, so this back's going to be a little bit brighter, kind of glowing.
I'm gonna have to switch to a smaller brush just for the facial features. I imagine Yeti's having uh, very deep set dark eyes. The only problem is the brush I have is not the best, but we will see. Now is the time where I have to steady my hand. Always remember shooting when I was used to be a deer hunter. I haven't hunted for quite a while, but I became a pretty good shot. I got my first my first deer. I got a six point buck, uh, over a hundred yards away. I was fourteen. But I remember that uh, you were always supposed to say in your head during my hunter education course, uh, relax, aim, squeeze, and shoot. So as we get into these details, there can be some element of relaxing, aiming for your, knowing where you're supposed to go where these lines are supposed to be. And then finally, squeezing the trigger, so to speak, forcing yourself to take the shot, make the line. There's no other way because if you're not confident with your painting, you can smell it a million miles away. So just fake it. If you're not confident, act like you are. Don't fiddle around with the same line a million times. Put your line down once and leave it. The more you mess with it, the more unsure it's going to look. You know, you can always see this and it's the easiest thing to spot, easiest critique to give. Is you should never tell what area of the drawing you spent the most time on or painting. Paintings should be universal, have a universal feel to them, that they were created all at the same time. Remember, you can always come back and fix stuff later. Now, what we're missing here, I'm going to keep keep going with, uh, with some more with some more darks here. Right now, it's really just the balance 
between too much, saying too much, and saying too little. So we're going to take all these big value shapes, and we're going to be a little bit illustrative with them. Refine them more. But this is all just guessing, really. Edges, edges, edges. It's always about edges. The only reason why I haven't got into uh, finish this stuff up, maybe it's annoying some of you, I should just get rid of it, but. Uh, I'm going to focus on all this fur color first. Yep. It's easy just to go crazy and, and screw the painting up at this point. But there are certain places you gotta hit. Because I'm, I'm not done, I gotta go on top again. Oof, that was a big commitment, wasn't it? pop in our our final colors here. Basically I'm gonna go for a little bit more of a flesh color. So we're gonna steal steal some of this orange. Make some new orange on top of it but keep it dirty. And we're gonna lighten it up. As always, just do a little tester. Because I know these hands, hands are actually going to have a big, yeah, good. This hand's going to have a, a nice big spot. No, this is the first time I've cleaned my brush. Finally. I'm going to clean the, lot, the little one because this blue will infect everything. And I do have to start my plastic man over, which means we're at about 40 minutes or an hour. <laughs> I knew these hands were going to be a really important part of the painting.
I have to go even higher. So it just adds a little bit more white to this color. Easy to make these hands look too rubbery. I don't want to do that. see just the little bit of flesh that this guy has around his face. Flesh, well, normal skin without hair, hairless skin, what do you call that? Skin? If you don't have fur, you've got what? If you're a human, I guess just skin. His most human like skin around his face here.
is asleep. Foot is asleep. Foot is asleep. It's nice we got these lines in there, but we got to eliminate this top because there's no way it's supposed to be his thumb coming up in the front here. Or what Yeti fingernails look like. Let me go back to my... Make up a nice dirty, nice dirty purple to cut out the inside of that arm area. You can start seeing the finalized, yeah, start to see the finalized version of our, our Yeti.